If God is just, He must judge you righteously. And a righteous judgment means your death in hell forever. The greatest question in all the Bible is how can God be just and the justifier of the wicked? Look what Paul says here. Verse 26, For the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time, so that He would be just and the justifier. This is the problem. This is what the cross is all about. This is the divine dilemma. If God is just, how can He justly forgive wicked men and declare them to be legally right before Him? Let me give you an illustration that I've used a million times. Let's say that you were to go home from this preaching tonight and find your family has been slaughtered. And you see the, the assassin standing before the last one with a little bit of life in their body. He breaks their neck and drops them to the floor and laughs. He runs out the door, you run out the other door, you knock him to the ground. You bind his hands and you call the police. The police come and pick up this man who has murdered your entire family and they lock him away. And then, in due time, they present him before the judge. The judge looks down at the man who has murdered your entire family and he says this, I am a very loving judge. I pardon you. Go free. What is going to be your response? You're going to demand justice. You're going to write the newspapers. You're going to call the television stations. You're going to write congressmen. You're going to say that there is a judge on the bench far more wicked than the criminals he pardons. There is something even in you that cries out for justice. This cannot be. Then shall not the judge of all the earth do right? I have heard evangelists say this, not knowing that they were speaking blasphemies and heresies against God. I've heard them say, instead of being just with you, God was loving. You know what they're saying? God's love is unjust. That God can be unjust. There is, even among our race of people, a what? An unjust love. People love things unjustly. They demonstrate affection in a wicked way. You cannot say and be biblical that instead of being just, God was loving. God's love must be just. God must satisfy justice that cries out against you because of your sin. Now, it's not as some suppose. Some people will think, well, there's, are you saying that there's this rule of justice that even God has to submit to? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is, God Himself is just. And God is perfect and consistent in all His attributes. In order to pardon the wicked, the justice of God must first be satisfied and the wrath of God appeased. Something must, and this is a very important word, and you can look it up in the dictionary, someone must interpose. Someone must intervene. Someone must do something. And being there's only two parties, one being God and the other man, we put no hope in man. God Himself must intervene to satisfy His justice, appease His wrath, and make it possible to express His love in salvation toward wicked men. Now let me talk for a moment about something that will be quite offensive to you. I want to talk a moment about the hatred of God. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, just raise your hand, have ever heard a sermon on the hatred of God? One, two, three, four, five. Well, this is better than normal. The hatred of God. Brother Paul, what, as one lady said, God, God doesn't hate. God is love. 
Therefore he cannot hate. No, God is love, therefore he must hate. Before we go to the Scripture, let me just give you an idea. Do you love babies? I do. I've got a bunch of them in my house. I just love babies. So the hardest thing about my ministry is being away from my babies. I don't care if they're eight feet tall, they're still going to be my babies. If I love babies, I must hate abortion. Do you, do, do you love Jews? I do. You must hate the Holocaust. Do you love African Americans? You've got to hate slavery then. I'm sorry. There's just no neutrality. You see, if you truly do love that which is right, that which is perfect, that which is good, there is also an animosity, an enmity against all, the, all that that contradicts that standard. God loves all that is right, all that is true, all that is good, all that is virtuous. But Scripture after Scripture after Scripture in the Bible tells us that His hatred is manifest against wickedness. I could remove it if you'd like. I could be silent if you like. But I wouldn't be faithful to God. Let me give you a good text. Go to Psalms chapter 5. Just for a moment. Psalms chapter 5, verse 5. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. Now, you know that wonderful statement that goes something like this? God loves the sinner and hates the sin? Just look at this text. Is that what it teaches? It's not what it teaches. I'm sorry. I know it's a pretty thing to say and it looks good on the back of a contemporary Christian t-shirt, but it's not what the Scriptures teach. It does not say here that God's hatred is manifested towards the wicked deed. It says God's hatred is manifested towards the one who commits it. Now do not be mistaken. God's hatred is not like ours. It is not a self-centered, egotistical, selfish hatred. It is the reaction of a holy God against men who are vile. Well, who are you speaking of? Every man who was ever born a son of Adam. You need to understand. Just what do you think the wrath of God is? Some impersonal thing that flies out from behind the throne of God? It is God. When people come to me and they say, Brother Paul, God saved me. I always love to ask them this question. From what did He save you? Well, He saved me from my sin. No. He saved you from Him. You know all those passages? Prepare to meet thy God. God is holy. He cannot look upon iniquity. His eyes are too pure. That the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness. You and your sin being encountered by a holy God, there is only one response. Wrath. But God's love is of such a character that is even able to love and show love and demonstrate love towards the objects of His wrath. It is though with one hand God is holding back His justice against this world and with another hand He is pleading for men to come. But one day both hands will be dropped. You know that, don't you? Let me give you another example. Heaven is heaven because God is there. Well, that is, most, that is true. But then the counter is not true. Hell is hell because God's not there. That's not what Scripture teaches. Hell is the wrath of Almighty God. It is His perfect justice revealed against men throughout an eternity. Now some of you will walk out of here tonight shocked. You'll say, I've never heard anything like that. You'll say, He was mean-spirited, all sorts of things. But I can assure you, if you would only read old books, you would find out this is what preachers have always said. They don't say it anymore because they want big churches. 